Good morning, it's seven o'clock. You're watching the only breakfast show live from Westminster. A boost for the government's COVID vaccine programme as it's extended for the third time this week to include all over 40s in England. And a boost for Boris Johnson with the Conservatives apparently extending their lead in the polls in spite of the row over the refurbishment of his Downing Street flat. We'll speak to the Home Office Minister, Victoria Atkins, shortly. In a strength, the woman lifting weights as she rebuilds her life following the sudden death of her husband. And the Boilermakers bubbling along nicely. We'll talk to the rising stars of British music, Royal Blood. It's Friday, the 30th of April. Breaking news, more than 40 people are killed in a stampede at a religious festival in Israel. We were standing and, and waiting for our friends. Uh, we were going to go inside for the dancing and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden we saw paramedics from Mada and whatever running by, uh, like mid-CPR on, on kids. Denying any wrongdoing, the actor and producer Noel Clark responds to allegations of sexual misconduct as he's suspended by BAFTA. Rallying support for his spending plans, President Biden marks 100 days in office. 1,300,000 jobs in 100 days. That's more Jew new jobs in the first 100 days of any president in history. Please sign up. The NHS in England asks all people over 40 to book their first coronavirus vaccine appointment. Opening a corridor, the Irish government says it's considering plans for free travel between Britain and the Republic. And it's a case of sunny spells and April showers for today, but how's it looking for the bank holiday weekend? I'll have the answer for you later in the programme. Good morning. We begin with breaking news, and at least 44 people have died in a stampede at a religious festival in Israel. Ambulance officials say dozens more are critically ill in hospital. It's believed a grandstand collapsed at an event to honour an historic religious leader. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has described the incident as a heavy disaster. Ender Brady reports. This mobile phone footage was taken moments after the stampede. Men clambering through the gaps in the corrugated iron to escape the crush. Tens of thousands of ultra-Orthodox Jews had gathered here in northern Israel to honour a second century rabbi. The crush happened in the early hours of the morning. We were standing and, and waiting for our friends. Uh, we were going to go inside for the dancing and stuff. And uh, all of a sudden we saw paramedics from Mada and whatever running by, uh, like mid-CPR on, uh, on kids. Uh, and then one after the other started coming out, ambulances. Uh, and then we understood, like, something's going on here. Ambulances lined the street as the rescue effort continued long into the night. Casualties were transported to local hospitals, with some airlifted 130 miles to Jerusalem. It is a very challenging event in general without anyone being hurt. It's uh, happening once a year for a couple of days. It's a big, big celebration of, of tens of thousands of people that are uh, uh, gathering uh, for uh, about 48 hours, sometimes even more. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called it a heavy disaster. It is one of the country's worst in peacetime. The Lag Balmer Festival is the first religious gathering of its kind to be held legally since Israel lifted nearly all coronavirus restrictions. Authorities here had permitted 10,000 people to attend, but there are reports that 100,000 showed up. Enda Brady, Sky News. Well, we can speak now to Yoni Yagodowski from the Israeli Ambulance Service uh, who, who joins us now this morning. Um, good morning to you. First of all, tell us about this festival. It's been the largest gathering since COVID and what exactly happened? 
Well, it is a huge gathering that happens uh, on a, an, an annual basis. Uh, last year it didn't happen because of the COVID, and this was kind of a celebration of the end of uh, the pandemic here in Israel. Uh, probably due to um, the crowds that were gathering in a relatively narrow path, people were simply falling over, and uh, there was a lot of crowd, a lot of pressure of the crowds. Magenda de Dome uh, was uh, at the site uh, with hundreds of uh, medical personnel, like we do in every year, and immediately responded to the site, uh, began to treat the people, resuscitate those who needed resuscitation, provide uh, advanced medical care, and... Uh, begin the transportation to the nearby hospital and further on hospitals. We have deployed close to 200 life-saving vehicles in addition to the huge fleet that was there already since uh, about uh, 36 hours earlier. Uh, and what uh, precipitated the disaster? Um, we understand, correct us if, if this is wrong, that there was some sort of stampede. What, what brought that on? It's a, it's a hilly area with a, a lot of uh, various buildings up in sight, and there are a ceremony that is conducted uh, in a relatively small area. Uh, it is timed through groups and groups that are doing their own ceremony uh, around, uh, along the night. And while people were already on the way down from the main ceremony, uh, the path became uh, was a little bit narrow then in the beginning. It's uh, walking down and people tripped over. Those that were behind them simply uh, walk on them. And that's what created this horrible, horrible incident last night. W would it be fair to say that the capacity of the, the venue simply wasn't sufficient for the, for the number of people that attended? Well, I, I, according to the information that uh, we have received, uh, in previous years, the gathering has pretty much more than a double amount of people. There were the, the estimation was that there were about 100,000 people there. In previous years, we used to have even uh, close to a quarter of a million uh, people attending. So, uh, and the preparations were according to these anticip uh, anticipation in all uh, aspects, police, uh, uh, first aid, uh, uh, fire department, uh, security, etc. Uh, but this incident happened. I know that it is now under investigation and there will be a thorough investigation about the entire causes to this horrible event done by the authorities. Um, and uh, we are, as the, the emergency medical services, uh, provided the best services that we can provide. And we know that people were in critical condition, but uh, were able to reach the hospitals um, with our ambulances. And now we will need to figure out what to do. Well, we are also expecting funerals that will happen today in various places in Israel, it is a huge tragedy. OK, Yoni Yager, Dosky, thank you very much uh, for speaking to us this morning and bringing us up to date with the situation in Israel from the Israeli Ambulance Service there. Thank you. As the row about allegations of sleaze continue, the government is focusing its attention elsewhere. Last night, the new domestic violence bill was passed by Parliament, promising new protection for victims. Well, let's uh, speak now to the safeguarding minister, Victoria Atkins, who joins me uh, this morning. Um, are, are you confident that the bill, having passed, will completely protect uh, those in situations of domestic violence? We know that the numbers have risen through uh, lockdown uh, and those people now coming out uh, of lockdown, will they be 100% protected? 
Well, this, this bill is a truly landmark bill. Uh, we know that there are 2.3 million adult victims of domestic abuse in this country, and of course, children who live within abusive households as well. And this bill, first of all, puts a definition of domestic abuse and the many forms it can take, but uh, which is important for commissioning of services at local level, but it does so much more than that. Uh, we are making real meaningful changes to the ways in which family courts operate, because we know that abusers sadly can often and try to use the family courts to continue the abuse. We're prohibiting non-fatal strangulation. We're prohibiting uh, the use of threats to use revenge porn. We're um, uh, making changes to the uh, so-called rough sex defence, clarifying the law on that. So there's a huge amount of work that we're doing to help uh, victims of domestic abuse and also in critically to stop perpetrators. We're seeing record levels of investment under this government in programmes to stop perpetrators because we've got to stop this cycle of abuse, this uh, perpetrators going from one uh, relationship to another. And I think this is a real body of work that the bill provides the foundations for, but we're very conscious that the hard work starts now implementing it. The bill, however, has received criticism of how it deals with, with stalking after the amendment requiring offenders to be monitored on a national register was dropped. Why would that be dropped? I mean, surely a register actually keeping uh, tabs on, on offenders is going to help those that are being abused? Well, in fairness, I think this bill has received uh, support from across the political spectrum. I know you're focusing on that particular point, but genuinely, this has been a you know, real, um, it's been Parliament at its best, I would say, because we've listened to ideas and suggestions and where we've been able to, where we think they will work, we've absolutely listened and then acted. Um, on this particular measure, we, we looked very, very carefully at it. It's very technical. It's about how we manage serial offenders uh, and also you know, the most violent and sexual offenders outside of a domestic abuse context context as well as within a domestic abuse context. But we have spoken, we've worked really closely with Baroness Rawl, who was the peer bringing this amendment forward. We have um, very much understood some of the concerns that have been raised. We, we're going to improve guidance. We're um, setting out new framework. We, we're, we're finding ways to address uh, the concerns that have been raised in the House. But we just, we weren't convinced that this particular amendment was the way to fix that. But of course, we will continue to keep this under review. Yeah. A national register is not a, a good idea. I mean, many lay people will, will think that it makes perfect sense. Yeah, so the, the problem with registers um, is that uh, if someone, it, it, what we don't want is people f falling between the gaps. So we have a really, really um, thorough system of managing uh, serial offenders, both uh, violent and sexual offenders, as I say, both in and out of a domestic context. 85,000 offenders are managed under this system of, called MAPA. Uh, and um, the what we want to do, they will be stalkers, but they will also be, sadly, sexual offenders. They will, they will be um, very, very violent offenders. And uh, what we're doing is, is looking at the system as a whole. We are very conscious that uh, the some parts of the system uh, are, have li outlived their usefulness. Uh, the visor system is more than 20 years old. So next year, we will be piloting a brand new digital uh, forum, which we believe will really answer some of these concerns that have been raised. But the critical point about managing stalkers is about the decisions that are taken at local level to manage the risk of these people. Uh, and that's what we need to focus on rather than, we think, setting up a new register. Uh, let's move on to uh, the Prime Minister regarding um, allegations of, of corruption and saying that there's nothing to see. Um, when the Electoral Commission has said it has reasonable grounds to launch an investigation. Surely, shouldn't the Prime Minister just actually say who paid for the refurbishments in the first instance, rather than allowing all these investigations to be launched? Well, the Prime Minister has set out uh, his uh, case very clearly, actually, in, in the House of Commons on Wednesday. He was that direct question, though, has he? In the Commons, he didn't answer that direct question. Well, he's answered the, the questions that were put to him. And, and um, I know that... He was asked yes or no. Did he um, pay for the refurbishments? And he didn't answer yes or no. 
Well, as I say, the Prime Minister has answered those questions. As you know, I'm on here to talk about the domestic abuse bill, but the Prime Minister has answered the questions. He has very much um, given his answers to the House. And I, th I do wonder, you know, here I am today, we're, we've got this amazing piece of legislation that will help, as I say, millions of people across the country. And it would be nice if just today we could focus on that. Well, we, we have, we have. That's how we started the interview. We have asked you about that. There's but so also more, people, yeah. people are wanting to have answers to questions that the Prime Minister isn't simply answering. Well, I don't accept that. As I say, he's, he's answered questions in the House of Commons. Uh, we had the, we've had the announcement of uh, Lord Guite being appointed as the independent advisor. Uh, and of course, you know, th these reviews, these inquiries will uh, take their path. But the Prime Minister has answered to the House. I, I don't really feel I can add to that. But, but ultimately, as Downing Street has said, the Prime Minister will be the, the ultimate arbiter of, of any inquiry. Uh, that's like marking your own homework, isn't it? Well, no, the way that we work our democratic system in this country is that the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of the day wins a general election uh, and uh, he or she appoints the government uh, and then he or she is answerable at the dispatch box in Parliament and, of course, in due course, at the ballot box to the electorate. And so he must have control over who is in his government. He's answerable for their actions. It seems to me the consequences of some of the suggestions that have been flung around in the press this week haven't really been thought through. I'm not sure anyone wants an unelected, uh, unaccountable advisor, impeccable and in, uh, in, with all of the integrity that uh, Lord Guy has. I'm not sure that that is an addition to our constitution that uh, we want to walk into without fully understanding the consequences. Uh, we do know that Sir Alex Allen quit the role after the PM essentially overrode his findings regarding Priti Patel and, and bullying. Um, how do we know that the Prime Minister is going to listen to any findings of any investigation? There are some nine investigations at the moment. Well, first and foremost, th this process has been transparent. Uh, and I think, you know, in terms of the previous investigation, that has been settled. The, the Home Secretary apologised uh, on national television um, for the uh, findings of that review. And so, I, I, again, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm not sure I can add anything more to what is ignored it. The Prime Amy. Minister ignored it. Well, namely that um, the, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister has to have uh, the uh, control of the government, has to have the confidence that his ministers are the ministers he wants to uh, exercise the incredible responsibilities that uh, ministers have in government. And that seems to me that that, that has always been the case and, and must continue to be the case. Minister, thank you very much for speaking to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, our political correspondent, uh, Rob Powell, joins me now. Morning to you, Rob. Uh, what did you make of that? Well, I think uh, the government's broader strategy in dealing with these allegations and accusations around the Downing Street flats has been to try and move uh, the story on, talk about other things that it says are more important. Uh, and that was clearly um, strategy this morning. No doubt, yes, the domestic abuse bill is a very, very important piece of legislation that a lot of work has gone into over a very long time uh, and does deserve scrutiny and questions, uh, as we just had um, there. But uh, I think when you look at what's happening with the polling, it may well vindicate their approach. The government has been saying, look, the public aren't bothered about this. This is a Westminster bubble story. Actually, the polling does show that that lead the Conservatives have over Labour going into this local elections doesn't seem to have been dented. Now, that doesn't mean that this isn't important. And you touched on some of the issues, the broader issues, which is why these stories are important, about accountability, about whether the processes are robust enough uh, to hold ministers to account. And I thought that was the one area where Victoria Atkins did give a little. She talked about the uh, independent advisor for ministerial standards. There's been a lot of criticism of that post this week that actually Boris Johnson gets to make the final decision and can overrule that independent advisor, calls for him to be made more independent, to be given more powers uh, to act um, independently off his own back. Uh, and what Victoria Atkins said was we didn't want an unaccountable or unelected uh, person operating in that way and that wouldn't be a good addition to the constitution. There'll be a lot of people in Westminster that disagree with that. OK, Rob, thank you. See you a little later in the programme. The actor and director Noel Clark has denied allegations of sexual misconduct. The Guardian newspaper said 20 women who had worked with Mr Clark had accused him of harassment. BAFTA has suspended him and withdrawn an award he won earlier this month. 
Anisha Sethi reports. I did actually have a speech prepared, which you've all now ruined. <laughs> this life of yours, it's just too much. I, I couldn't do it. No, man, I love you. You sure? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Come here. He's a well-known actor, director and screenwriter. Having showcased his talents in Doctor Who and Bulletproof, Noel Clarke is now the star of ITV's latest primetime drama. So we would like to use your flat for surveillance purposes. Earlier this month, he accepted BAFTA's Outstanding British Contribution to Cinema Award. Hopefully people see that I've tried to elicit change in the industry. So this is for the underrepresented. Anyone who sits at home believing that they can achieve more. Now, BAFTA has stripped him of the prize, following allegations of serious misconduct. The Guardian newspaper details claims by actors and production staff who worked with Clark. Some say they felt pressured to take part in nude scenes or auditions. Others claim he subjected them to unwanted physical contact and made inappropriate remarks. BAFTA has released a statement saying, In light of the allegations of serious misconduct regarding Noel Clark in The Guardian, BAFTA has taken the decision to suspend his membership and the Outstanding British Contribution to Cinema Award immediately until further notice. The actor strongly denies the allegations and says, in a 20-year career, I have put inclusivity and diversity at the forefront of my work and have never had a complaint made against me. If anyone who has worked with me has ever felt uncomfortable or disrespected, I sincerely apologise. I vehemently deny any sexual misconduct or wrongdoing and intend to defend myself against these false allegations. Every day for a week we're just supposed to be your girl. Clark was widely acclaimed for his work in the hard-hitting film trilogy, Cadulthood, Adulthood and Brotherhood, which explored life in inner-city London. A rising star of BAFTA, the actor's career is now on hold as the allegations are investigated. Hanisha Sethi, Sky News. 100 days after he took office, President Biden has taken to the road to sell his plans for a huge trillion dollar spending spree. Mr Biden spoke at a rally in Georgia as he tries to build support for a major new infrastructure programme. Our US correspondent Mark Stone reports. Georgia was the state which propelled Joe Biden to the White House. Republican for nearly two decades, it was these supporters who flipped it blue in November and the president chose the place for a victory lap 100 days on. 1,300,000 jobs in 100 days. That's more new jobs in the first 100 days of any president in history. But it gave a hint too that in this divided country he is a president being pulled to the right and to the left. And attention now! And attention now! We'll give you a microphone. A heckler calls for him to stop detention relax immigration rules on the Mexican border. To the east of Atlanta, Stone Mountain is a town where they know all about the divisions President Biden inherited. These quiet streets were the scene last year of angry protests. The backdrop was the town's controversial history, carvings on the mountain of Confederate generals. This was once the place where the Ku Klux Klan lingered. Switch. At the local martial arts club, instructor Walter Maddox is relieved that all that is behind them, he hopes. His focus is his business, and the new president, he says, has delivered. He's stepping into a lot of things. There was a lot of turmoil, there's a lot of tragedy, and I think if, in time, uh, things will heal and things will, will definitely get better. We just got to be patient and just give them a chance to work it out. Young Republicans like Adam Keller believe the Biden successes are in part an inheritance of Republican policy. The rest, he says, are proof of a far-left agenda. It's an advantage, he thinks, for the return of Trump. Now you have an administration where he's saying that he's centrist, but his actions and his policies are so far left, and when the middle see that, they are not really sure where to go. So part of our agenda that we need to really get across as far as Republicans go, we need to find the middle again. Outside the state capital, a hint of one of the nationwide challenges. 
Fallon McClure is a local attorney and democratic activist. I do think we have to move forward. I do think we need to come together. If we start thinking about how we're more alike than different, perhaps we can start bridging that divide. If America is, as President Biden insists, moving once again, well, it feels still to be in two very different directions. Mark Stone, Sky News in Georgia. Also making the news this morning, anyone aged 40 and over in England can make a coronavirus vaccine appointment. The NHS has nearly three quarters of a million people booked to receive the jab on Monday and Tuesday this week. Brazil has become the second country in the world to see its death toll from coronavirus reach 400,000. The health ministry reported more than 4,000 deaths in two days. Less than 6% of Brazilians have been fully vaccinated against the virus. The online retailer Amazon has announced its profiles have trebled. The company's sale for the first three months of the year rose 44% to almost $109 billion. The Irish government says it's willing to consider plans for a travel corridor between the UK and the Republic. The Deputy Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, said this could be introduced instead of relaxing international travel restrictions. The co-op supermarket says it will remove all plastic bags for life from sale. The company says it believes customers are using them in the same way as single-use bags. And a reminder for you that you can see the Daily Climate Show later today. That's at 6.30pm and 9.30 this evening here on Sky News. Time now for the weather with Naz, and I can just uh, see through the windows that the sun is peeping up. Yeah, and there will be some sunny spells around today, but in between there will be some uh, April showers. Some of them will be rather potent as well. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning to you. So it's a case of April showers once again for today, although it starts off fine. But as we see cloudier skies develop this afternoon, there will be quite a few of these showers cropping up and some of them will be heavy and thundery. And in fact, that's a story for the rest of the week. And for Bank Holiday Monday, it's looking very wet and windy. Until then, fine this morning, quite chilly though, frosty for central and eastern parts of England. There are some coastal showers, particularly heavy for southeast Scotland and northeast England. And then the showers become more widespread this afternoon as the cloud bubbles up. Some of them will be quite slow moving with the light winds and uh, the risk of them being heavy and thundery with some hail likely as well. So it is going to be quite wet at times throughout today in between some dry and brighter spells. It's going to be quite cool for the time of year with temperatures well below the seasonal average. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, the end of a testing week for the Prime Minister. We'll discuss whether allegations of sleaze will have any effect on next week's elections.
Our main story this morning, at least 44 people have died in a stampede at a religious festival in Israel. Ambulance officials say dozens more are critically ill in hospital. It's believed a grandstand collapsed at an event to honour an historic religious leader in Mount Meron, 100 miles north of Tel Aviv. President Benjamin Netanyahu has described the incident as a heavy disaster. A short time ago, Yoni Yagodovsky from the Israeli Ambulance Service told us what happened. OK, we'll bring you that uh, from the Israeli Ambulance Service, that uh, audio, a little later on. Well, the Prime Minister may say there's nothing to see here as far as allegations over the funding of his Downing Street flat refurbishment are concerned, but he was clearly riled by the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, at PMQs. What do we get from this Prime Minister and this Conservative government? Dodgy contracts, jobs for their mates, and cash for access. And who's at the heart of it? The Prime Minister, Major Sleaze, sitting there. This is a government that is getting on with delivering on the people's priorities, including tougher sentences, Mr Speaker, for serious sexual and violent criminals, which he opposed, Mr Speaker. We're getting on. And by, and by the way, I, I forgot to mention it. I forgot to mention it. Last night, our, our friends in, in, in the European Union voted to approve our Brexit deal, which he, which he opposed. Well, Labour are keeping up the pressure, but uh, claims of sleaze resonating with voters ahead of next week's elections. Well, joining me now is Victoria Borwick, a former Tory MP and former Deputy Mayor of London under Boris Johnson, along with Professor of Politics at Queen Mary University of London and the author of the Conservative Party, Tim Bale. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Um, to you first of all, Victoria, uh, is there nothing to see? Well, I think the point is, you know, as we've already seen from this morning, uh, Boris is still ahead in the polls and the electorate, I think, are getting on with what matters to them. We've seen the rollout of the vaccine. You know, many parts of the country now haven't had any deaths from COVID over the last month. You know, things are getting so much better. We've got our opportunity of living our lives again, seeing those we love in the care homes. So how the Prime Minister's partner decorates the Downing Street flat, I think has rather moved on. So you're, you're subscribing to the, the nothing to see line, but uh, Professor Tim Bale, we, we've rarely, I don't think, ever seen the, the Prime Minister so riled at PMQs. He, he was really angry. Yes, I mean, I think it is clear that Keir Starmer uh, got to him uh, at PMQs, whether that means necessarily that there is uh, what some people like to describe as cut through with the electorate, uh, we'll have to see. Uh, Victoria's quite right when she says the opinion polls suggest that it's not affecting uh, the Conservatives' poll rating at the moment. However, that is a different issue uh, from whether actually something occurred here which shouldn't have occurred. And of course, that's what the Electoral Commission are, are looking into. If it was the case that someone else initially paid for this refurbishment, however trivial that may seem to some people, that, that is an issue because it should have been declared. We do have rules for a reason, and therefore it seems perfectly reasonable for the Electoral Commission to look into that. Uh, and Victoria, why not simply put all of this to bed and answer that, that simple question, who initially paid for the refurbishments? He was asked to give a yes or no answer by Sir Keir Starmer yesterday, and he didn't. He had the opportunity and he didn't. Well, I think the, the point is that inevitably the bills were paid and now we know and it's been confirmed well, that Boris has paid. With due respect, that's, that isn't the point. The point is who initially paid for it in the first instance, not who ended up paying for it in the end, which we know was Boris Johnson. Yes, that's what I was going to say. That's something I we've now got several inquiries who are obviously going to investigate the detail of, of all of this and exactly who paid in, in, in at what time, and it'll, it'll all, all be sorted. But you know, the important point is that the moment, as far as we know, uh, you know, Boris has paid the bills, and we've just got to sort out now um, exactly, you know, whether that means there's going to be changes in the system in the future. That's what the inquiries. The inquiries will do their bit. The inquiries will will do their investigation. But, you know, we have got an election time next week. We have Keir Starmer shopping in John Lewis tomorrow. If that wasn't an election stunt, which just proves how this is all blown out of all proportion, rather than getting on with what really matters to people, which is the only game in town, which is getting us better after the pan 
after the pan pandemic and sorting us out after I'm, COVID. I'm not sure that, that, get... that nine inquiries points to it being blown out of all proportion. Um, <laughs> Professor Tim, Tim Bale, um, we were talking before about uh, the, the, the polls and the fact that actually the, the Conservatives, Boris Johnson's 11 points ahead of, of Labour. Is it that people do not find this in, interesting at all? Or is it that they're simply used to allegations of corruption um, and they're used to, to what's been banded around as, as sleaze? Well, I mean, I think there is an extent to which, as people say, uh, this kind of behaviour is to some extent priced in uh, to Boris Johnson. Uh, he's never presented himself as a paragon of virtue, so people aren't entirely surprised if it seems as if he, he may not have acted in an appropriate manner, allegedly. Um, there is also uh, the, the possibility, uh, as you've suggested, that um, you know, many people think that there are more important things going on. The vaccine rollout, for example, they're more concerned about the economy and they're feeling you know, fairly optimistic about that, it seems. So you know, that may make a difference uh, as well. But I come back to the point is that we have to separate what people think about this, and they may not think it's that important, from the fact that it is possible that quite important rules about transparency and declaration, et cetera, have been broken. And, and we can't get away from that. Uh, those inquiries are important. And, of course, they could have consequences for the Prime Minister and, of course, the Conservative Party in the sense of perhaps if the Electoral Commission do find that something has gone wrong, uh, the party may be fined. Some of the other investigations, particularly if one involving the, the Commissioner for Parliamentary Standards, which Labour are calling for now, you know, finds Boris Johnson has, has uh, acted inappropriately, there is a possibility that he could be suspended temporarily from the House of Commons if that inquiry were to go ahead. So there are consequences here. And in, in some ways, there should be consequences because we have to hold our, our public servants to uh, uh, high standards. Otherwise, um, things will begin to slip quite badly and we don't want to live in a country like that. And Victoria, if the Electoral Commission does find that there has been wrongdoing uh, and Boris Johnson is implicated, or in, in other inquiries, should he resign? Well, I don't think we've, we've quite got to that yet. I mean, I think the important no, that, point that's, that's what I'm, made... I'm suggesting. We're looking ahead to if there, there is a negative finding about the Prime Minister, should he resign? There are a number of inquiries which the Commission and the others are going to run, and obviously they're going to have to look at the process of all these, all the ways of all these things are, are funded. I mean, if we only give somebody £30,000 a year to refurbish, which to most of us seems a lot of money, but if Boris is Prime Minister for a long time, that would potentially give him the opportunity of sending £300,000. So I think, you know, these, are, these amounts, um, you know, are, are quite uh, important when you consider that you're decorating a, a home that receives international visitors. And obviously, there's got to be a better way of funding it. And I think that's one of the interesting debates we should be having. He can't be the first person who's needed to decorate and not necessarily um, known, you know, the total costs at the outset. How many but of us are you have suggesting had a that, that, I'm the... sorry, I'm not clear on what you're suggesting. You're suggesting that £30 is sufficient or it actually isn't sufficient? I think it's an awful lot of money. But on the other hand, if you're going to do a renovation that you're, where you're hoping to be somewhere for a long time, I suppose you've got to look back and say, well, he spent this money 10 years ago. It won't look so, you know, it'll look a much more reasonable amount. So it, it could be, uh, yes, uh, justified is, is what you're saying, I think. Anyway, Victoria Barwick and Professor Tim Bale, uh, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. Time for a look at the day's sport for you now with Alice. This sports bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025. Well, the best place it feels like to start is the Spurs game and your performance and the result in general. How much did the club need that? To get the revenge from the previous game that we had against them, because we still had the inside. Everyone had the inside, you know, losing like that at home. And um, just for the point as well, with the result uh, that happened in the weekend, it was good for us. It was uh, very important. 
There was a really nice moment after the game that the cameras picked up, you and Ollie having a little chat. It looked like he was complimenting you on a part of your game. What's your relationship like with Ollie at the moment? Well, he wasn't complimenting me. He was, he was telling me that I should have scored. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but no, obviously, uh, we, we have a very good relation. Um, he understand me. Uh, he put me on the pitch. He trusted me to, uh, to play uh, in the middle, on the left. And uh, that's, all the, that's all the player needs. There was a really interesting, what we'd call like a war of words between Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Jose Mourinho before the game and after the game. And it was amusing for us to watch. What did you guys make of it as players? I don't know what happened. I'm sure Mourinho put something or said something uh, that would the uh, people speak. That's what he does. And... Uh, uh, we got the result that we wanted. Just uh, Oli knows it, and we, we enjoy that. We enjoy that moment. What do you think the differences are between Jose Mourinho's style of management and Oli Gunnar Solskjaer's style of management? What I have now with uh, with uh, Oli is different because he would he wouldn't go against the players. Maybe he doesn't put them or. It's not like you put them on the side and they don't, they don't exist anymore. And I think that's the difference between uh, Mourinho and, uh, and Oli. Because... Committed to getting 100 million people 20% more active by 2025. From today, London City becomes the first major airport in the world to use a remote digital control tower. Planes will be directed by staff 70 miles away rather than controllers overlooking the airfield. Jemima Walker reports. This now redundant control centre was once the eyes and the ears of the airport. But now dusty binoculars have been replaced with 14 cameras which feed live video 70 miles away to Hampshire, where panoramic screens can be overlaid with extra data. What we're able to do is augment the information that the air traffic controllers would have had in our traditional tower with more information which is right in front of them. So that includes radar data, weather data, call sign of aircraft. So it just gives them much more information uh, to, to operate more safely. The multi-million pound project aims to make the airport more efficient and safer. You can see that here in the old control tower, operators had a direct view onto the runway. In the new one, they rely on cameras, albeit very high-tech ones, so systems must be totally fail-safe. Cybersecurity experts say a remote tower could open up the systems to attacks, but it's a threat that can be managed. There is definitely always uh, a risk with systems of this nature. For one thing, increasing complexity is a problem where we move from something very simple, the, the kind of stereotype image of somebody leaning out of a window with binoculars to having cameras and monitors and remote connections. The increased complexity is a problem, but it can be handled in the way that we would handle building any kind of resilient system. The technology is being viewed as a major development in the aviation sector. Of course, not many of us are getting our passports out at the moment. But when we do, it's likely we'll see an increasingly digitised flying experience. This kind of remote technology could become commonplace. Jemima Walker, Sky News. Still to come on Sky News Breakfast, vaccinating the world. A new campaign aims to raise funds to provide injections for the world's poorest people.
I'm Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that's just landed in between us. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them in for trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. The past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, they were right. We hear uh, shotguns being fired and also tear gas is being uh, put around. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but it's big withdrawn. It's so, so hot. Does anyone know which particular parts of your body can be damaged by air pollution? After a mostly fine start this morning, most places will become cloudier this afternoon with frequent showers. Some of them will be locally heavy with hail and thunder and perhaps wintry over the high ground from the north of Wales northwards. It will be a cool day everywhere too. So taking a look at the air pollution levels on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being very high, most places will be at a low level of 1 to 3 again. However, some isolated pockets of moderate pollution are possible, mainly in the south. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Campaigners are calling on the public to help raise funds to pay for coronavirus vaccines in the world's poorest countries. They say without better vaccination rates in other countries, Britain remains at risk from new mutations of the virus. Well, let's speak to vaccine campaigner and founder of charity Give Them a Shot, Yorick Mose, who joins me now. Good morning to you. Um, what are the specific problems that are being faced by developing countries in terms of, of vaccinations, of, in terms of containing the virus? Thank you very much for having me on, Gillian. Appreciate it. I think some of the large problems at the moment um, in our campaign, where we're trying to raise £100,000 for uh, UNICEF's work with the COVAX facility, is the fact that they're having a problem with getting supply to them. And that's because of a couple of reasons. Some, because um, countries in the high income world are sort of overordering. So, campaign, so Canada with a population of 37 million has ordered 5.4 times what it needs of 400 million. Um, the Serum Institute of India has stopped exporting um, in March. So that COVAX won't be able to get to its 100 million target that hoped to by the end of May. It'll only get below that at 49 million. So it's, it's as much a supply um, issue as um, us trying to do the good work we are in vaccinating our own populations, but there are others who really need it as well. So tell us about the Get One, Give Two campaign, um, what, what, what that's trying to do essentially. Thank you very much for asking. So what we're asking the British public to do is when they get their first or second um, dose, we're asking them to get one, give two. So give the equivalent of two doses, which for the AstraZeneca um, vaccine would be about six pounds to our campaign at givemeshot.co.uk. And are you confident that, that people will see the need? I mean, there are those who say, you know, charity begins at home. We haven't vaccinated our entire population uh, and that should be our first um, uh, port of call before we start helping others. 
Of course, we completely understand that, but we've been lucky enough to vaccine over 50% of our population. We've got a shot at a normal-ish 2021. You know, today we're looking at a, a rave in Liverpool testing that, or potentially going to places like Portugal or Malta in mid-May. And we know that the British public are a generous and empathetic bunch. You know, where we saw with Captain's Tom Moore last year, every other year we see with um, comic relief. So um, six pounds, hopefully, won't uh, will be a small enough amount to encourage people to help others and show that empathy, which we know the British public have in, in spades. Uh, and what impact will delayed vaccination have on developing countries? I think some of the big challenges are that you know, whereas we might have, you know, even full vaccination by the end of this year, some estimates are that some countries won't have that level of vaccination by the mid or even end of 2023, that's a 60% level of, of, of overall vaccination. And what that means is mutations might still happen. Um, I'm no epidemiologist, but that's what I've been told. And likewise, they could quite easily come here, but also schools will continue to be closed, debts will increase the rack up, and then the economic development, which is already a widening gap, will get even wider as they don't get the chance to get their people to work, to export, etc., or even need um, tourism dollars that will help them to develop, develop their economies. Uh, and we do hear constantly, don't we, that, that no one's safe until we're, we're all safe. Uh, it is a, a global village, so it might seem a, a distant problem, but actually it could affect us eventually. Very much so. I mean, we, uh, we talk about um, the Indian strain, the Kent strain, and other strains will happen if many people aren't vaccinating and we reduce that transmission rate. And so they're almost the best chance for us in going on all our exotic holidays, you know, whether it's the 1.6 million people going to South Africa or others, is to um, vaccine the world as well as ourselves. And I take it because of the, the campaign, you don't believe that uh, we're doing enough to, to share vaccines and to consider other countries th through this pandemic? The UK has donated £568 million to, um, to COVAX, which is a really good commitment. But we also know that it's um, that the overseas development aid has gone down from 0.7 to 0.5% of GDP, which is about £4 billion. So there, there is a gap which we used to give, which we could donate further. And, and likewise, a lot of the, the, the pledge money, the sort of eight, over $8 billion that's been pledged to COVAX has come from often governments. And so there's a real opportunity to tap into those private donations, that, that private generosity to, to help others. How much are you hoping to raise? And in effect, how many vaccines? We're hoping to raise £100,000 um, for UNICEF, um, and that will help support the work they do with COVAX through um, uh, vaccinating frontline healthcare workers 20% through delivering the vaccines and um, hopefully purchasing them as well. Yorick Moose, thank you so much for speaking to us behind the campaign. Get one, give two. Good to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at the weather for you now with Nurse. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Good morning. It's a case of April showers for today. The last day of April will be seeing some heavy showers moving along this afternoon. Very slow moving ones as the winds will be light. And in fact, it stays showery for the rest of this week and for Bank Holiday Monday, very wet and windy. To begin with this morning, though, not too bad. Mostly dry conditions around inland areas, but coastal parts are seeing quite a few showers, particularly heavier at the moment around the southeast of Scotland and northeast England. And then as we go into this afternoon, the cloud amounts will increase. And as that cloud bubbles up, then more frequent showers are likely. Now, it's going to be quite hit and miss. Some areas may not see any showers at all all day, most likely across Northern Ireland and later the southeast of Scotland will be largely dry. But elsewhere, I think there's a pretty good chance of seeing a shower or two. Some of them, as I said, with the light winds will be slow moving with the risk of some heavy downpours, some thundery ones and some hail. And on top of that, temperatures well below average for the time of year.